support the organization or organizing this lecture, so I really wanted to uh, recognize them individually by name. Blue Bay Castaneda, Wallace Cleese, Madeline Bosiaco, Zane Cassim, Linda Lamb, Lisa Maldonado, April Mays, Sarah Lynn Morales, Lynn Miyaki, Angela Mooney Diarcy, Charles Polda, Asena Teoni, Felipe, and Miguel Anwar. So I just like to thank all, um, all those individuals for helping in a variety of different ways to make this uh, lecture series and today's talk uh, possible. Uh, before we, uh, with that said, I want to say Hafadei, Tomus Hamzu, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Alan Flores. I'm an assistant professor in the Intercollegiate Department of Asian American Studies at Harvey Mudd College. Uh, my co-organizer, um, uh, my co-organizer, Dr. Mike Manolo Pedro, here in the front, who is the director of the Asian American Resource Center, and I would like to welcome all of you this evening to the third and final lecture that is part of the IDAS, the Intercollegiate Department of Asian American Studies, signature event on the topic of militarization and decolonization. Um, if you don't know, the IDAS Signature Event is a program that seeks to expand our understanding of Asian American studies through a variety of activities such as lectures, workshops, and community engagement opportunities. This year's topic on militarization and decolonization is based on the book anthology entitled Militarized Currents Towards a Decolonized Future in Asia and the Pacific, which was published in 2010 and co-edited by Setsu Shigematsu and Keith Camacho. This anthology has encouraged us to think about the various ways the, that communities throughout Asia and the Pacific Islands um, have been affected by militarization, but have also responded through different acts and forms of decolonization. It is in this spirit that we have put together this signature event to learn how scholars one decade later are working to address these issues through their work. Uh, with that said, I would like to uh, now introduce uh, Pinsir College student Jonas Pontus. Uh, um, Pontus, so Jonas, if you'd like to come on up, please. Let's give Jonas a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very grateful to be speaking to you from Mongolian today uh, and to be sharing a little bit of my perspective on indigenous organizing here on campus. Uh, my name is Jonas Fanta. I come from the Prairie Chicken Clan of Mandan people and I'm a citizen of the three affiliated tribes of Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikara. And I'm also a senior at Pinsir College, um, as well as a founding member of Indigenized Academia Now, and in my third year as a mentor for the Indigenous Peer Mentorship Program. Um, these two organizations function as the primary advocacy and resource groups for Indigenous students here on campus. Um, Indigenized Academia Now, or IAN, is a uh, working group composed of indigenous students who advocate for uh, the presence of North American and indigenous studies across the Claremont Colleges. And we are currently involved in the creation of a major here at Pomona College through the History Department, a minor at Scri uh, Scripps College, uh, the acquisition of a dedicated space on Pomona campus, and we share a long-term goal of creating the world's first intercollegiate uh, Native American and indigenous studies department. Um, IPMP, the Indigenous Peer Mentorship Program, is a first-year mentoring program that pairs established Indigenous students with incoming freshmen to provide oversight and resources during their introduction to higher academia, as well as provides community organizing events, such as Friday to Fridays, speaker series during Native American Heritage Month, and uh, sponsors the attendance of Indigenous students to every new Take Away Tea movie. Uh, we would like to... Uh, we are very grateful to the Asian American Resource Center, the Intercollegiate Department of Asian American Studies, the Johnson Fund, the Pacific Basin Fund, and the Ina Thompson Fund of the Pomona College History Department for sponsoring this event and speaker series and elevating indigenous voices in academia. Uh, I am also honored to share a couple of guests with our speakers tonight. Um, so for you all, we have uh, a medicine bundle that I actually harvested myself. I'm very grateful for your presence. And we're also going to have a pair of student made earrings. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to turn back over to you for the support. So, thank you guys. Thank you very much. I would like to, now like to introduce um, Tom Lukini member and UCR professor Wallace Cleves, who will be giving our opening remarks. So let's do that right now. Miha, net one hene weha Wallace Cleves, awesh koneha awesh kwa aha tobangar. Hello, 
My name is Wallace Cleves. Um, also, two, that's the way up. Um, uh, I'm happy that you are here with me in Tobangar, the Tongvo world. Anangare uh, Ekwa Um. We are still here. Uh, thank you for being here with us on Tongva land today. Uh, I am a member of the uh, Gabrielino Tongva uh, tribal nation. Uh, our headquarters is in uh, San Gabriel. Um, but we are the indigenous people of the Los Angeles Basin, uh, including portions of northern Orange County and portions of San Bernardino and Riverside County. Um, we are related to uh, our cousins, the Tataviam, who are in the San Fernando region, the uh, Hashiman, who are in southern Orange County, uh, and the Kawia, Serrano, uh, the San Diego peoples, uh, to our east and south. Um, the topic today that you're going to hear about is uh, militarization and uh, decolonization. And I, wanted, I, I tried to think a little bit about what that meant for our community, for the Tonga community. Um, my family, uh, it, we always kind of introduce ourselves by saying who we are. Uh, my family is not a military family, but we have been military families. Um, but we've been affected by the military in many ways. Um, my great-great-great-grandmother uh, was Narcissa Higuera. Uh, her, her true name was uh, Lutsu, um, and she was taken to the mission and baptized. Um, but she was a singer trained in the traditional songs, and she was one of the last living uh, fluent speakers of our language. Um, she recorded a large portion of our language with Seahart Miriam, uh, and her voice is the only recorded voice speaking Tongva. Uh, it's on a single wax cylinder that is in the Smithsonian, um, which we have had digitized, so it will uh, spread forever and live forever on the, on the web. Um, but uh, my family has not really served in the military, but it is an important part of our community in many ways. That's, of course, incredibly common with most Native communities. Uh, American Indians serve in greater numbers uh, in the U.S. military than any other ethnic group, and they have served since the Revolution. Over 20,000 served in World War I uh, without citizenship. Native Americans make up only 1.4% of the U.S. population, but make up 1.7% of the armed forces. Since 9-11, 19% of Native Americans, this, this number shocked me, have served in the armed forces, compared to an average of 14% for all other ethnicities. 27 have received the Medal of Honor. Uh, the nation's highest military decoration. The military also appropriates Native American names and cultures. The Smithsonian Museum of the American Indians exhibit the Americans, which just, just closed recently, um, demonstrated by including Apache helicopters and Tomahawk missiles in its collection. And our own community, we have seen many members serve. Uh, I have known Al Lassos, who served in World War II, uh, who's with our ancestors. Uh, John Lassos, who's the Vietnam era. And currently, both Benny and John Rudless uh, serve in the Marines and the Navy, uh, respectively. Um, in the wake uh, of World War II, uh, many Native American servicemen were sent to Los Angeles, both to recover and mustered out. Uh, this is, experience is evocatively captured in Silco's seminal work, Ceremony, where Teo recovers in a veterans hospital in Los Angeles and has a traumatic episode on the, at the Grand Central Station. Um, this is important because it affects uh, the colonization of our land. Um, we have a very interesting case of being colonized and I, I want to use that term very carefully because it's not intentional on the part of other Native Americans usually, but we are colonized not only by uh, settlers, but by other Native American communities as well. And that's an important part of our experience as well. Um, that experience has been exacerbated by a, a whole set of policies, including the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, uh, which was part of the termination policy. Uh, of that era, which led to a huge diaspora of mostly younger Native Americans uh, who were pushed to major urban centers, including both the Bay Area and Los Angeles. Um, that would have uh, unintended consequences, of course, uh, including the occupation of Alcatraz and the founding of the American Indian Movement, as you have noted in the chapter U.S. Triumphalism and Peacetime Colonization in your wonderful book. Um, but it had also a really profound effect on us uh, in that we are a community that is really covered over by three waves of, of colonization. Uh, first by the Spanish and Mexican colonization, by the American colonization, and then 
by just the fact that so many Native Americans were relocated to the Los Angeles area. Um, as of the 2010 uh, U.S. Census, California had 723,225 persons who identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, uh, almost twice that of the next state, which was Oklahoma, with over uh, four and a half, uh, 482,000. Um, that's out of a total U.S. population of just over four and a half million. That number increased by almost 100,000 uh, from the 2000 census, and almost 14%, 13.9% of all Native Americans live in California. Um, the 2010 census showed that New York had the largest American Indian uh, and Alaska Native uh, alone or in combination population, followed with 112,000, followed by Los Angeles at 54,000. But Los Angeles itself counts the number to be 157,517. Uh, that means that Los Angeles effectively has, arguably, the largest Native American population in the country. Of that, though, uh, only uh, somewhere around, somewhere between a thousand or so are Tongva. We are outnumbered by almost all other, <laughs> by so many other communities, including the Cherokee, who are estimated to be at 2,811. Uh, and the Apache and Navajo with 2,000 uh, or more in the community. Um, this means that we're often invisible, even in our own homeland. Uh, and when I think about decolonization, this is one of the most critical things that I can emphasize. This is why for us, land acknowledgments are so important, acknowledgments by universities and other institutions, because we have to constantly fight for our awareness. And that awareness is important for us because it makes possible things like getting a cultural center, having access to our lands for gathering, for traditional medicine, for traditional ceremonial practice. These are really critical things. You may have seen the, uh, the acknowledgement by uh, Watiti on the Oscars that was with, uh, the, with our tribe's um, uh, approval. And it was really important for us. But of course, decolonization is much more than that. Um, we've been colonized since uh, the, the Spanish arrived and the American, the great American genocide of California, which the governor just recently acknowledged um, and acknowledged the murder of over 16,000 California Native Americans between the 1840s and the 1870s. But of course, our people were incarcerated in the mission system, which Benjamin Madley noted in his uh, problematic but important book, American Genocide, um, and also identified in his article, California's First Mass Incarceration System, that the missions acted as an incarceration system for our people as well. This is an ongoing trauma for our people, um, and it's affected by all of these forces. Uh, and I think it's incredibly important to acknowledge how those forces, and to think about the history of how those forces have affected us. So I thank you for giving me this time to give you a little perspective on how that's affected our communities. And now, on a much happier note, it is with great pleasure that I get the honor of introducing Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, a historian, writer, and professor emeritus in ethnic studies at California State University Hayward, <laughs> my wife's alma mater. Um, she is author and editor of 15 books, including Roots of Resistance, A History of Land Tenure in New Mexico, and the literary memoir trilogy, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, Outlaw Woman, a Memoir of the War Years, 1960 to 1975, and Blood on the Border, a memoir of the Contra War, and her award-winning 2014 book, the seminal work, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Her most recent book is Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, forthcoming a book on the US claim to be a nation of immigrants. And please let us give her a very warm welcome. to um, Alfred Flores for uh, moving with this. It seems like a long time that this has been cooking, and I'm so glad to finally be here. So everyone involved, I appreciate it so much. And I've met some of you throughout the day here, and I hope I uh, get to talk. Um, we, I will leave some time for discussion, hopefully, and hope you will participate. 
And yes, I want to acknowledge that we're present here on the unceded uh, land of the Tongva Nation. Um, was not given up willingly, and so it's unceded. And um, uh, I'm so honored to have a, uh, a representative of the Tongva Nation here to introduce me. Thank you. So, I, um, what I, I call this talk I'm giving this evening is Continental Imperialism and the Origins of the U.S. Way of War. Why the United States is the most militaristic um, nation state in human history and does not regard itself as such. A recent tiny Associated Press story provided polling information of the United States American public regarding their confidence in federal government institutions. Um, reporting, you will not be surprised to know that only 6% have confidence in Congress. 14% said they have confidence in the executive branch, which includes the president and the cabinet, his cabinet, and all the agencies. 24% say they have confidence in the Supreme Court. However, 84% have confidence in the military. That's really significant. Uh, I don't think pe most people know that, um, that there's almost a cult, cultish <laughs> regard for the military. Those who are opposed to the U.S. military-industrial complex, uh, those of us, I should say, have a lot of work to do in repurposing the U.S. military for peaceful uses, such as rushing aid to hurricane victims in Puerto Rico, as it would go to war. Or what they did uh, actually very valiantly under George W. Bush, uh, in assisting the um, people, victims of the tsunami um, of the early 2000s uh, in Indonesia and the Indian Ocean. So they are capable of doing positive things, but how do we get from war to humanitarian aid uh, with that great capacity of the U.S. military? It will require that that 84% of people who now trust the military above all institutions come to oppose using the military as a destructive war machine. But that won't happen unless we come to grips with the historical roots of endless U.S. wars and understand how that came about. We also won't understand gun violence in this country. Uh, mass shootings, gun violence, gun ownership, 300,000, 300 million guns for 300 million people. <laughs> um, but only 30% of people even own a gun. So first it's essential to acknowledge the fact that the United States has been at war since its founding. I have not been able, I challenge people, show me a day in U.S. history a 24-hour period when the U.S. was not at war. And I will admit that it wasn't every day. No one's been able to show me that day. So this is continuing uh, the colonial settlers' wars that violently occupied and expanded to the 13 colonies, created the 13 colonies over a period of 170 years, and through the Seven Years' War of Independence, during which they made war on the native <coughs> communities of the colonies' peripheries, and in occupying the very densely populated with native people, Ohio Valley, continuing through the entire 1800s, including invading and occupying Mexico and annexing half their territory, then militarily invading and occupying the Philippines, Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico, on and on, continuing on steroids in the Middle East in the 21st century. So 
These have been made up uh, historically of various things, civilian militias, special forces, Marines, Army, National Guard, CIA, they have their own army. They're warring somewhere all the time, some of them are. Even during the four-year Civil War, the United States, both the Union and Confederate armies, or their agents, were making war on the nations of the Diné and Apache, the Cheyenne and the Dakota, in hideous massacres like Sand Creek, uh, massacres of civilians, and forced relocations in Minnesota and the Southwest. The mercenary Kit Carson was commissioned to round up all the Diné people and incarcerate them. And, and out of the 8,000 Carson and his band of Indian killing militias herded into the southeast New Mexico desert camp called Bosque Redonda, half died during the three years of near starvation and abuse by army troops. The roots of the U.S. military, all that occurred during the Civil War that you never read about when you read about the Civil War. Uh, and, and the Confederates and Union soldiers were both fighting the Native people. And there's even one occasion where they're fighting at the same time on the same side against the Apaches. So the roots of the US military lie in what Anglo-American colonists call savage war. That is war against savages, what they call savages who did not rise to the level of deserving anything but extermination. Once you call something a savage, um, that's a homo sector, that's a non-person, and they're to be killed. That's not really killing. It's not even considered killing. So this is what is called counterinsurgency in, mili in US military annals and is theorized as the United States' first way of war by military historian John Grenier. This way of war in North America dates to the British colonization of Ireland and is described as a combination of unlimited war and irregular war, a military tradition that accepted, legitimized, and encouraged attacks upon and destruction of non-combatants, of civilians and their villages, and their food supplies, and shockingly violent campaigns to achieve their goals of conquest. The United States is not exceptional in the sheer amount of violence or bloodshed when compared to other colonial conquests of Africa. I think of the Congo. I think of the German colonies in southern Africa, genocide in Asia the Caribbean, and South America, and the Pacific, certainly the Philippines. And the settler colonial British colonizations of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand were all genocidal in attempting to eliminate indigenous existence. Colonialism is violence, is genocide. So the United States is not exceptional, but um, what distinguishes the United States experience is not the amount of or type of violence involved, rather the triumphal mythology called history that's attached to that violence and its political uses even today. It's celebrated. It's not celebrated anywhere else. It's some shame, even apologies and real history that has come out thanks to the Aboriginal people in, in Australia, the Maori in New Zealand, and you've just witnessed, if you've been paying attention, the fantastic uh, resistance movement in the Pacific Northwest and Vancouver, Canada, where all the native people across Canada closed down all the highways and bridges and railroads and all. So um, this is, uh, uh, much harder to do in the United States. It's much harder to be Native American in the United States because it's differential in power internally. When history is translated into nationalistic and militaristic myth, 
as happened in the early 19th century in the United States. The complexities of social and historical experiences are simplified and compressed into representative individuals or heroes, like the founding fathers, Daniel Boone, um, Davy Crockett. From the first settlement in Jamestown, appropriating the land from its stewards, the indigenous people, became a racialized war, civilization against savagery. Savage war was distinguished from civilized war in its lack of limitations on the extent of violence and of laws for its application. The doctrine of savage war depended on the belief that certain races are inherently disposed to cruel and, atro um, and atrocious violence. Um, I mentioned that in the during the War on Terror, when uh, John Yu, a constitutional lawyer at UC Berkeley, was advising the Bush administration and finding that torture was okay, uh, they used cases uh, about Native people, the Seminole, uh, the Seminole cases, and the Seminole War, uh, the Second Seminole War where it was, um, even though it was a war between two nations, it was a war of one big nation against another nation, the Seminole Nation, uh, that they could hang the Seminole uh, resistors um, because they were savages. And another case, the uh, Modoc Native people in Northern California also could be hung because they were homo sacred. So these, these are precedents that are still legal in U.S. law, U.S. constitutional law, that they used uh, in the invasion of Iraq and in torturing at Guantanamo. Uh, so these are, this isn't just history. This is reality of U.S. law. Uh, and John Muir wasn't wrong. Everyone you know, on the left criticized him and said, how can that be? But they don't know their history. He was absolutely correct you know, in, in using these precedents. Uh, but it didn't seem to gel with, well, that's terrible. We have to do something about that. Um, so similar assumptions had often operated in the wars of the Christian Crusade states against the Muslims. Um, and uh, in North Africa, the Levant, and the massacres had often um, accompanied such wars. So there's also a tradition that the U.S. taps into uh, in its colonialism and its imperialist wars. This way of war, largely devised and enacted by settlers, formed the basis for the founding ideology and colonialist military strategy of the independent United States. And this approach to war is still being practiced almost as a reflex in the 21st century is the war on terror. They always end up attacking civilians. I don't know if you've noticed. They don't kill very many armed people in these wars. <coughs> in the 20th century, the United States carried out large-scale regular warfare alongside counterinsurgency in the Philippines for 40 years. Europe, Korea, and Vietnam, as well as smaller scale and prolonged invasions and occupations in the Philippines, Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic, as well as counterinsurgencies in Colombia, Southern Africa, and decades still continuing in the Philippines, uh, in the Philippines um, and Afghanistan, and more recently, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, and Syria among others, regarding the enemy as non-human, homo sacred, or unlawful combatant, they made up that word in the Bush administration, without humanity or rights. And this is a continuation of how indigenous peoples were regarded by the U.S. military in the 19th century. So during the period in 1607, the founding of Jamestown, the first Anglo colony um, that became the United States eventually, uh, to 1814, 
the architecture of the U.S. military was forged, leading to its reproduction and development in the present. This formative period generated the problematic characteristics of the U.S. way of war and thereby the characteristics of U.S. American civilization, which few historians have come to terms with in manifestations of these tendencies in the post-World War II period we are still in. Unfortunately, including um, socialist historians and theorists, and as well as peace activists, simply not acknowledging this reality. And this is why we don't have an anti-war movement, <laughs> if, you've not, if you've noticed that we don't have one. Much less an anti-militarism movement, never massive in US history, except those few years during the last decade of the 20-year U.S. war against Vietnam, <coughs> Laos, and Cambodia. But it is not enough to oppose this or that U.S. war. Rather, U.S. militarism must be dismantled, as well as imposition of economic sanctions, which is another way, evil way, for starving people. Iran has one of the largest, the largest outside of China, outbreak of the uh, coronavirus, and they do not have medications. They are getting them from China now, but it got a long ways. Um, it's killed about 10 officials of the government, even. So-called anti-imperialist figures in the U.S. war against Mer uh, Mexico feared that, quote, Mexicans would poison the U.S. population. I don't call that anti-imperialism. That was Walt Whitman, the transcendentalist, Thoreau, Emerson, who are said to be anti-imperialist. But their reason was having Mexicans in the population would poison the bloodline of Anglo-Saxons. So if that's a definition of anti-imperialism, we're really in trouble. <laughs> Uh, during nearly two centuries of British colonization on the Atlantic shore of North America, generations of settlers gained experience as Indian fighters outside any organized military institution. Anglo-French conflict may appear to have been the dominant factor of European colonization in North America during the 18th century, but while larger regular armies fought over geopolitical goals in Europe, Anglo settlers in North America, settlers, self-organized, waged deadly ir uh, irregular warfare against indigenous nations to seize their lands, resources, roads, driving the indigenous out or forcibly relocating them west of the Mississippi in the 1830s and 1840s. In a book written in the early 17, uh, 1800s after independence, Historian Joseph Doddridge, a minister and early settler in Ohio country, wrote that on the frontier every man was a soldier, and from early in the spring till late in the fall was almost continually in arms. Their work was often carried on by parties, each one of whom had his rifle and everything else belonging to his war dress. These were deposited in some central place in the field. A sentinel was stationed on the outside of the fence so that on the least alarm, the whole company repaired to their arms and were ready for combat in a moment. Who were they fighting? Grizzly bears? Right? No! The native people whose land they had taken and they're holding on to, um, trying to get it back or limit the further expansion into their territories. Much of the fighting during the eight years settlers war for independence from Britain, especially in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes region and western New York, was directed against indigenous resistors, who realized it was not in their interest to have an even more empowered close enemy of Indian hating settlers <coughs> their own independent government as opposed to a remote one in Great Britain with wider global interests. 
Nor did the fledging um, U.S. military in the 1790s carry out operations typical of the state-centered wars occurring in Europe at the time. Even following the founding of the professional U.S. Army in the 1810s, irregular warfare was the method of the U.S. conquests as they went across the continent, including taking half of Mexico, using the same irregular anti-civilian warfare, two years of it. Since that time, irregular methods have been used in tandem with operations of regular armed forces, especially uh, air power. Most military historians ignore the so-called Indian Wars. And of course, civilian textbooks have nothing uh, at all about them. And they ignore the, the period, the 1846 to 48 invasion and occupation of Mexico. But these wars formed the platform, the genealogy of officers and mindset of US military actions in the US Civil War, the invasion of Mexico, and the rest of the world. The generals of both the Confederacy and the Union uh, had been uh, already in the, in the war against Mexico and the Third Seminole War and the Second Seminole War, Robert E. Lee, um, all of the main generals had been in, in those Indian Wars before, or the Mexican War before the Civil War. And those same, uh, this, a new generation of those generals from the Civil War then became the ones who occupied the Philippines and in the Caribbean. And it went on and on. So this is a, um, often families, I mean, real, real families, but the generals' names in the Philippines, when you study Asian history or the Pacific history or Philippine history, you learn all the names of those generals over there. They were the same ones that came right up after Wounded Knee, who, and they were using the same tactics as they used. And they even called them Indians. Indians. <coughs> they used that same language in Vietnam about uh, whether or not the South Vietnamese could plant corn. They use the, the language of Indian wars. You know, not to talk about all the military weapons being named, first types names, you know, like Rolling Thunder and uh, Apache and Kiowa. And so, I'll say a little bit about, just to give an example of the, um, how these uh, militias became officialized, these settler militias. It's the formation of the Texas, the Texas Rangers. You know, the Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, all of these are special forces, are patterned on these militias, the settler militias of the, um, um, of the 19th century and, and the colonial period. Uh, so the Texas Rangers, who are now the state police of, of, uh, of all of Texas, uh, they were formed uh, from settlers to extinguish the native presence in Texas after southern slavers illegally occupied the province of the Mexican Republic um, uh, before the Mexican War. So they were formed in the 1820s. Um, following the independence, of Mexico from Spain in 1821, the territory of Mexico included what are now the states of California, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, and Texas. Uh, much of that territory, except for northern New Mexico, is sparsely settled uh, by the Spanish, particularly the huge province of Texas. But uh, upon independence, Mexico continued Spanish laws that allowed non-Mexican citizens to um, gain large swaths of land under land grants for development and the implied eradication of the resident indigenous uh, uh, peoples. By 1836, nearly 40,000 US Americans, nearly all slavers, and not counting the enslaved, had moved to Texas. Their ranger militias were a part of that settlement and became known and later in 1835 formally institutionalized as the Texas Rangers. 
Once they were state funded and sponsored, they were tasked with eradicating the Comanche Nation and all other Native peoples in Texas. And what historian Gary uh, Clayton Anderson calls the ethnic cleansing of Texas. Mounted and armed with a new killing machine, the five shot Colt Patterson revolver, they did so with dedicated precision. While continuing violent counterinsurgency operations against the Comanches and other Native communities, the Texas Rangers played a significant role in the U.S. invasion of Mexico, 1846-48. As seasoned counterinsurgents, they guided U.S. Army forces deep into Mexico, engaging in the Battle of Monterey. Rangers accompanied General Winfield Scott's army and their Marines by sea, landing in Veracruz, and mounted a siege of Mexico's main commercial port city, marching on, leaving a path of civilian corpses and destruction to occupy Mexico City, where the citizens called them Texas Devils, as ra the Rangers and the Marines. Uh, Texas Rangers and the Marines roamed the city, terrorizing non-combatants, holding government officials um, hostage. In defeat and under military occupation, Mexico ceded the northern half of its territory, including the illegally Anglo-occupied Texas, because Mexico had never given it up to the United States. Then Texas became a state of the United States in 1845, but it seceded in 1860 to join the Confederacy, contributing the Texas Rangers as guerrilla fighters in that war, the Civil War. The Texas Rangers returned from the Civil War to the counterinsurgency against native communities and resistant Mexicans, and that's still what they mostly do today, is hunt down and torment uh, Mexicans. During the second half of the 19th century, the Army of the West, nearly all soldiers and officers from the Mexican War and Third Seminole War, including Robert E. Lee, warred against the peoples of the former Mexican territory in the Southwest and after the Civil War, the former Mexico, Mexican territories in the, um, uh, and Northern the northern plains in the Pacific. So, I want to mention one, you know, just something about the Marine Corps, because um, of all of the, I didn't give you that statistic, but when you break down the, the um, admiration for the military, as it breaks down, uh, it's the, the Marines that are the most uh, cultishly worshipped and mythologized. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the Marine Corps. From the beginning of the United States, um, uh, the United States was competitive in trade internationally, and free trade, actually economic domination, was the holy grail, then as it is today. Take the famed U.S. Marine Corps, founded in 1775, a year before the 13 colonies formed it, a Continental Congress. They preceded, even the founding of the Continental Congress, preceded the Declaration of Independence. A year before the Declaration of Independence, 13 years before the US Constitution was ratified, forming the state. So this was really um, institutionalized, um, uh, uh, malicious. And it was uh, 23 years before the U.S. Navy was founded. The Marine Corps is famously a part of the Navy now, but autonomous within it. But the Navy was not even founded for 23 more years after the Marines were founded. So they're fundamental to understanding uh, U.S. Uh, militarism. Um, so the following year, um, well, in, uh, in 1806, the Marines made their first landing. No, it, it was in 1777. They actually, uh, their first landing was capturing an island in the Bahamas from Brit the British, what the Marine Corps in history called Fort Nassau. You can, 
I got all this from their website, by the way. I didn't do any deep history. It's, they're proud of this, you know. It's, it's, just go read their website. Uh, and they were in action throughout the Revolutionary War. Uh, they were reorganized in 1794 uh, as an autonomous branch of the Navy. So the character of a Marine is that of a colonial ranger, created for, like the Texas Rangers, created for counterinsurgency outside U.S. secured territory. The opening lyric of the official hymn of the U.S. Marine Corps, composed and adopted in 1847, soon after the invasion of Mexico and during the occupation of Mexico City, is the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. From the halls of Mata, you've all heard this song. Well, most people understand that halls of Montezuma is Mexico. I think people are a little vague about it, what that is. Well, what about Tripoli? That's in Libya. In North Africa. Why is, the, why is that in the Marine? What is the lack of curiosity that people don't say? What is Tripoli doing in the Marine Corps anthem that was written in 1847? You know? Tell me. They had a pirate problem. Mm -hmm. Oh no, you're starting to build a rock. <laughs> they had a pirate, a pirate problem half a world away. No, the pirates are located in Libya, so they decided to go back and take the war to the pirates in Libya. Yeah, well, that? let me tell you my version. <laughs> it refers back, only a half century, to the Barbary Wars of 1801-1805, when the Marines were dispatched in 1801 to the North Africa by President Thomas Jefferson to invade the Berber nation. The Berbers are the people who dominated that area before they were pushed out by Arabs. They speak a totally different language than not Arabs. Um, they now are in the Atlas Mountains, mainly in uh, North Africa. Um, so this is an aggression. This isn't a defense. What is the United States doing in North Africa anyway? Shelling the city, taking captives, and marauding for nearly four years, ending with the 1805 Battle of Derna. It was there they earned the nickname Leathernecks for the high collars they wore as defense against the Berbers' saber cuts. This was the first Barbary War, the ostensible goal of which was to persuade Tripoli to release U.S. sailors it held hostage and to end what the U.S. called pirate attacks on U.S. Merchant, machine, uh, merchant ships. Actually, the Berbers were demanding that their sovereignty over their territorial waters be respected. They weren't the pirates. The Marines were the pirates. It was their water, not the United States. They fished there, too, and it was very disruptive. So the Berbers did not give up their demands, and the Marines were beaten. They withdrew. Returning a decade later called the Second Barbary War, 1815 to 1816, which ended when Pasha Yusuf Karamali, ruler of Tripoli, agreed not to exact fees from the U.S. ships entering their territorial waters, the first military victory of overseas U.S. imperialism or gunboat diplomacy, as it comes to be called nearly a century later in Central America and the Caribbean. The Marines and military history and military historians know this, this information. So if one learns at all about the Barbary Wars, it's yeah, they're fighting pirates. Well, you know, what were they doing in the Mediterranean? It's just you know, the U.S. is posed as this poverty-stricken little tiny place without an army, you know, would hurt anyone. Well, somehow they got merchant ships into the Caribbean and Marines that defeated um, a people and actually led to their, almost to their genocide, the Berbers. So the Marines' second large engagement was the second Seminole War. 
which was also overseas because it was in Florida, which was Spanish territory, not, I mean, Spanish claim territory, not U.S. That war raged from 1835 to 1842, the longest war in U.S. history until Vietnam. The Second Seminole War, during the Jackson administration has been identified with the extraordinary leader of the Seminole resistance, Osceola. So it was all out war with the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps involved against the Seminoles. Although they succeeded in killing Osceola, they lost the war as the Seminoles would not hand over the fugitive slaves who had taken refuge with them in the Everglades. And that's what was being demanded. They demanded that the Seminoles turn over um, the property. They called it the property, the enslaved Africans' property. Turn over the property, and you can have, nobody wanted the Everglades anyway, you can have this. It's all yours. And they wouldn't do it because they had become a common community by then, intermarried. And Osceola said, give us, uh, give you our flesh, our people, we can't do that. So they held out, and there was a third Seminole War, again, to, to um, uh, get the property of the southern plantation, or the slavers, and still refused, and that ended in 1859, the Civil War made it a new thing, you know, because the war against slavery. But the Seminoles never gave up, they're still there. Um, the military did succeed in deporting captives, mostly women, children, and old men, to Indian territory. So there is a Seminole uh, reservation in Oklahoma. So um, this battle of Chapultepec, where they wrote the um, the anthem. The Marines. It's not such a uh, glorious thing either. In in their annals, the 1847 Battle of Chapultepec is legion, as if they fought valiantly. But Mexicans they were fighting were a handful of teenage Mexican cadets. If you've ever been in Mexico City on the, on the reform of the the main drag, there's a statue to Los Niños who were killed at the Battle of. Uh, uh, Chapultepec. They were cadets. They weren't even soldiers. They had very few weapons. They were held, they were in the Chapultepec castle, which was used for military, it was a military training school. They had little ammunition, little weapons, but they held off the Marines, killing most of the Marines over the two days of endless fighting in the castle until the cadets themselves were all dead. And the remaining Marines raised the US flag and wrote their hymn, tracing their genealogy to the invasion and occupation of Tripoli and the killing of a few cadets, teenage cadets. So it's not a valiant history, um, and there has been. So I will end with that. I think I have one more thing. So I think we have to understand that um, what we have in the United States is a militaristic capitalist powerhouse that dates from the Constitution, that it's embedded in the Constitution itself. And this has been called a military fiscal state, meaning a state designed for war. So U.S. capitalism derives from real estate, which includes African bodies as well as appropriated Indian land. So it is apt, I think, that we have a real estate man for president today. It's as if we've come full circle. Much like the first president, George Washington, who became a notoriously successful land speculator in unceded Indian lands and African bodies by the time he was in his mid-twenties. 
The founders designed, designed a government structure in the Constitution to serve private property interests of each <coughs> and all of the primary actors in establishing the United States, nearly all of them slavers and land <coughs> speculators. With the brilliant Alexander Hamilton as the genius of finance, that is, the United States was founded as a capitalist state and an empire, and this was exceptional in the world and has remained exceptional in a way that does not benefit humanity or even U.S. citizens. So I think, you know, I think we have to understand um, also the first corporation that was founded by the United States before, uh, during the Continental uh, Congress, before the Constitution was written, was an arms factory, the Springfield Arms Factory that Alexander Hamilton founded. So the United States is still the major export of small arms in the world, and the owner we own in the United States, 45% of the world's small arms and civilian hands. We are 5%, 4.5% of the world's population. So we still have an armed citizenry as well. We still have the armed settler. And um, these are 30% of the population only owns arms. So it's a minority, but it's a very powerful minority because these, this is, this is Trump's base. You know, they have been, have con there's a resurgence that's been happening ever since the 60s, ever since the um, Supreme Court decision to desegregate schools. There has been this conscious resurgence of uh, white nationalism that the U.S. was founded on. So, I think, you know, it's, it's very hard to accept. Um, I think most people who immigrate to the United States have no idea about this history and feel, well, at any rate, um, they're not responsible because they're, um, you know, they weren't here, or none of us are responsible because we, we didn't do that. You know. But we are responsible to at least acknowledge the truth and, and try to deal with it in, in some organized way instead of letting it keep looping and destroying the world. So that's my message for you here in this beautiful place. Uh, it's a very hard one, but I think this is what we have to we have to face. So I don't know if we have a little time left with uh, can we stay fifty minutes or so? Questions or comments? Iraq vets against the war have a, you know, there's a big military base there. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was very important in the invasion of Iraq. And um, so I was, uh, they invited me over to meet with them and talk, and this uh, Iraq vet had um, laid out this idea, and apparently Veterans for Peace and Iraq Vets, they're actually working out, there are a lot of them now, a lot of disaffected vets, and I think they're the most important people in our society right now. Many of them are college <coughs> graduates. Um, they're, they just experienced you know, the, what I'm talking about and were repulsed by it. You wonder about those who don't have PTSD, uh, who come back from uh, doing these things. I wonder who's, who's the crazy one, you know? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, 
uh, horrific, you know, dehumanizing. So they said, um, and it is when I start thinking about how on earth could the, this is a that there are 850 U.S. military bases in 70 countries around the world. The next largest is um, is Russia with three. And they're in, you know, a friendly country, you know, friendly, friendly to them countries. Uh, China has one. And nobody else has bases in foreign countries. We have eight, over 800, 858 bases in 70 countries. And then these warships, you know, on everyone's shore in the world, and in the China Sea and in the Persian Gulf, warships, so like floating bases. I mean, these are hospital ships, these are warships. And you think, um, not to speak of the drones and the Air Force and everything, how will we ever get this under control? And so they had this idea that, well, this, this knowledge that we're going to have a lot of catastrophe. We have a lot of catastrophe now. There are earthquakes, there are tsunamis. These are normal things. I mean, oh, well, you know, abnormal, but they're not climate. They're not climate change things. They're just Earth being Earth. Um, but the climate change things are going to magnify in so many ways. Storms get worse probably not affecting earthquakes, but everything in the atmosphere, in the oceans, um, flooding everywhere, we're coastline, you know, all cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York will be gone, you know, in 20, 30 years. And refugees, we already have refugees from the droughts and the climate change in, in the global south. Uh, and some have theorized that even the Syrian civil war that's taken place, that, uh, underneath that is also a resource war because they've had endless, endless drought and crop failure. So refugees, yeah, there were refugees, but it's also a war that, that was, was creating refugees anyway. And people's movements in, in ways that can create civil war. Right now on the Greek-Turkish uh, border, the Greek uh, soldiers are, are pushing back against refugees from these wars to keep them in Turkey. So if we in the United States could come to have something to say about the government, uh, how it might be restructured or how something might change, um, to see the U.S. playing a role, they didn't, you know, under uh, Trump, the hurricane in Puerto Rico. They could have made um, such a big difference just, just using the hospital ship there, because hospitals were destroyed um, in the hurricane. The, now there's an earthquake, which has, you know, made things worse, but the hurricane. And, um, in some cases, like I said, in Indonesia, uh, the United States did play a positive role. I really followed it because I was worried. Um, there is a civil war going on on um, one of the islands that I paid attention to. It's, it's the indigenous people. They're fighting uh, people coming in and trying to take their land. And I've been following that, and it was hit hardest. So I thought, oh my god, you know, the US is sending the military. They're going to use this to, uh, you know, to do something military-wise, you know, to, to get involved in that civil war. And uh, so that made me, you know, I was paying attention to it. And I thought, I was really surprised. You know, they did actual humanitarian work, and very effectively, you know. and. Uh, so when, when this Iraq vet told me that, you know, I already remembered that. I thought, yeah, why not? You know, it's this big, highly funded operation that could be easily repurposed if there's a will to do it without the bombs. You know, take all the bombs and armament, armaments away, keep the hospital ships and the technical expertise and the telecommunications and all the things that makes it 
you know, the most powerful military machine in human history uh, into being uh, humanitarian. And I, I personally think it would appeal to U.S. people of all stripes, you know, that we'd be doing, because people really think we're doing something good with the military, fighting these savages all over the place, you know. I mean, they do. I think that's the main reason that they support the military, is they think they're doing good in the world. Because they don't really know. How would you learn this? In the news? In the newspapers? Yeah. I, I mean, how would you learn about what the U.S. is doing in the military? Unless you look it up. You can find all this stuff online, but you, um, you, know, you don't think to. If you have this in your mind, they're doing good in the world, why, you know, why look at the details? You, know, you don't need the details. So I think if people are made aware of the militarism and how it's so deeply in our culture, it opens up so many other things you know, for understanding um, uh, the lost wars. I mean, the United States can't win these wars. That's not the point to win, even win the wars anymore. It's just on attrition, you know. I mean, it, it's uh, more military <coughs> spending. And because the defense industry is um, uh, private, investor, you know, I mean, General Electric and Boeing and uh, um, McDonnell Douglas and all these arms uh, makers are, and including the automakers, they really, they make their money off tanks, mainly, you know, more than they do our silly cars that we have. Um, this this budget that goes into private uh, companies. So corporate America uh, likes the wars to go on because if you make all this machinery for killing and then you use it, you have to make some more of it. You know, you have, you have to get rid of it in order to make, to justify making a bunch of more. You have to make a new generation of a ship or a, a plane or whatever. And I think if you know it, it would take uh, also questioning the capitalist state that we have and how deeply embedded because it's really inseparable the military and the capitalist state the fiscal state and I think that's what's missing from what you know what um, what we try to do against. Militarism. What we did in the 60s, and I was part of the Vietnam generation, or the anti-Vietnam War generation, um, we had uh, you know, millions and millions of people marching in the streets. And I, I knew some of the things I know now about militarism. I didn't know everything that I, I the research I've done since, but I got worried that there's not going to be an anti-imperialist, anti-militarist movement when this war ends. And sure enough, in 1973, they fought for two more years, uh, air war only. They brought, they brought ground soldiers back in 73. But you could just see the dissipation. It was like seeing a snowman melt, you know. It was just attrition. And suddenly you look around and there are 20 people at a demonstration instead of 2 million. I mean, it really was that, that quick. And um, then with the Central American Wars in the 1980s, most of us who had been involved in the anti-Vietnam War got involved in the anti-intervention. And some of a, a younger generation sort of got involved. Um, but it never really took on in a, you know, and really got rooted um, as, uh, as a lasting thing. And when the Gulf War happened, when they said, okay, we can have big war now because the Vietnam Syndrome is gone, you know, the pacifism of that time, um, there were very few demonstrations. It was about the same time as, as the AIDS epidemic, and ACTA, and the only big demonstration I know about was ACTA, which is a wonderful organization 
occupied the Golden Gate Bridge and closed it down against the war. That's the only one I know. And that was their activism uh, for AIDS drugs and the stigma of AIDS, uh, to fighting the stigma of AIDS. They just repurposed it as anti-war, but I was driving across the country during that time, and all I saw were yellow ribbons supporting the Gulf War. It was kind of scary, um, because it was just huge support for it. So we've had endless wars ever since then. So I think, it, I think presenting, you know, a, a, what capitalism is embedded in the state and the militarism and not separating those two. So that's what, you know, I think your series here on uh, anti-militarism, if you could carry that forward, a uh, place like this, I mean, it, it can start anywhere, so why not here? I think I better let you go. <laughs> One of my favorite people at 7.30 is going to be over in the art museum, Jeff Chang. Go see him. So uh, thank you again. Uh, for those of you who have RSVP for dinner, please uh, stay after. I'll lead us away or tell you where to go. And if you want to come say hello to uh, Roxanne or Wallace, they're here. So please uh, feel free to come by and say hello if you want to. Otherwise, have a nice night. Thank you again for coming. Well, Thank you.